Good evening, everybody. It is um, a great pleasure to warmly welcome you to the RSC tonight um, on such a chilly evening uh, as well. Um, it's a pleasure to have our guest speaker with us here tonight, but before I introduce him to you, um, let me just say it's such a pleasure to have everybody here in person tonight. So John was saying uh, earlier to me that it's the first time you have been in Edinburgh for um, quite a long time, almost two years, I think. It feels to me like it's the first time I've been out of my house, probably in around about the same time. My name is Professor Nicola McEwen. I'm a professor of territorial politics, so with a great interest in this topic here tonight uh, as a representative of uh, the RSE. I'm delighted to introduce um, our uh, guest speaker uh, this evening, Professor Sir John Kay, also a fellow of the RSE and one of Britain's leading economists. His work is centred on the relationships between economics, finance and business and he has had a very distinguished career which will be familiar uh, to many of you spanning academic work, think tanks, business schools, company directorships, consultancies, and investment companies. Um, John has been a fellow of St. John's College, Oxford, since 1970, and has held chairs in the London Business School, University of o Oxford, and at the LSE. And he's been very closely connected with the Scottish constitutional debate, having served uh, on the First Minister's Standing Council on Europe in the last a parliamentary session, and also a very prominent commentator on the economics of independence, and in particular on the issues of currency, which will be uh, the subject of his talk uh, this evening. So I look forward uh, very much to hearing um, his take on the very substantially different context in which the constitutional debate um, is being uh, conducted, or will be conducted, um, in the years to come. Following uh, Sir John's talk, we will hear a response from uh, Professor Graham Roy. Um, Graham is a Professor of Economics and Dean of External Engagement in the College of Social Sciences at the University of Glasgow. Between 2016 and 2021, he was Director of the Fraser of Allender Institute at the University of Strathclyde, and prior to that was a Senior Economist, uh, Economic Advisor uh, within the Scottish Government, including uh, during the crucial period leading up to the 2014 independence referendum. After Graham has responded, there will be an opportunity uh, for you to ask uh, what will doubtless be insightful and hopefully challenging uh, questions, uh, both to Sir John and to, to Graham. And without further ado, I will hand over to Sir John Key. Thank you, Nicola. There is probably no issue which caused more difficulty in the 2015-14 referendum campaign than the issue of currency for Scotland. And it's an essential, I think, that before we engage in a renewed debate on independence issues, that we are much clearer about the issues and the background to this particular question. When Sir Walter Scott left uh, Abbotsford dying to try and recuperate at Naples, we can imagine that he took with him a, a bag of sovereigns. They'd be, have a, they would have been gold sovereigns, and they would have had on them uh, the, the head of uh, King George. He might have taken a letter of credit from a Scottish bank with him to Naples, although no, we know that Sir Walter's credit was not such that he would necessarily have been pre-approved for the American Express Guard. Uh, but he would then have changed these in Naples for Neapolitan piastres, which would have borne the head of King Ferdinand of the Two Sicilies. That was the 19th century Victorian world in which currency consisted of gold, of gold coins, and occasionally for banknotes, which uh, referred to gold that was kept in the vaults, or supposed to be kept in the vaults, 
of, of commercial banks, and because it wasn't always kept in the vaults of commercial banks, uh, the central government took over a monopoly of note issue towards the middle of the, around the world towards the middle of the 19th century. That's a world which we call the world of chartalism, of national currencies that are associated with sovereignty in the particular sense that they're even associated with the sovereign of a particular country. And that's a world that came to an end, essentially, in 1914. The period between the two wars was a period, essentially, of economic chaos. And after the Second World War, there was an attempt to restore some kind of stable global monetary order. It was encapsulated in the Bretton Woods Agreement reached in 1944, of which Jim Keynes was one of the major architects. But that world essentially broke down in the late 1960s and early 70s. I'm going to apologize now because I'm going to take through you through what is in effect an introduction to Money and Banking 101. For those of you who get interested in going on, perhaps even to further courses in Money and Banking, I can tell you there is a 10,000 word paper which elaborates the concepts I'm going to introduce tonight. But I think unless we understand these basic concepts of money and banking and money transmission, we are not going to understand the issues, the rather particular issues, which we are going to face in Scotland. And I did, um, I remember doing a course in Money and Banking 101 in this city at the University of Edinburgh. It was, the year was 1968, and the course was delivered by Innes Smith, not, I fear, the most inspired lecturer of the, of the University of Edinburgh. But Innes Smith passed away in the 1980s, and by the time he had passed away, the world he was describing to us in these lectures had also passed away. In 1967, the pound was devalued against the dollar. Harold Wilson famously, indeed notoriously, said, the pound in your pocket has not been devalued, but it had been. And in the early 70s, inflation in Britain actually reached 27%. In 1971, President Nixon took America off the gold standard. He broke the link between the dollar and the gold, and gold at which the, bank, uh, the Federal Reserve System was ready to buy and sell gold at a fixed price. And that was the end forever of the gold standard which had prevailed in the 19th century. In 1968, in a rather more mundane event, Barclaycard introduced a credit card into the UK, which was the beginning of the plastic cards that are today ubiquitous and are the principal ways nowadays in which we actually make payments or everyday payments. Innes Smith told us a lot about what we called fractional reserve banking. And you will still people hear people throwing around the phrase of fractional reserve banking. But that was the idea that uh, banks needed to keep a fraction of their deposits with the Bank of England. Uh, and that was a mechanism by which the Bank of England controlled the money supply. That control mechanism was abandoned in 1973. And from the 1980s, banking regulation has been principally governed by the international banking agreements, which were reached in Basel in the, in the 1980s. Notice that they were international uh, banking uh, agreements, because the internationalization of money and banking was a central part of the change which had occurred then. In 1968, in, in his day, Smith's days when I was a student, there was still exchange control. In order to, um, in order to take a foreign holiday, you had to uh, obtain foreign currency, and you were limited to 50 pounds of currency a year, which wasn't a great problem if you were a student, 
but it would have been a considerable problem to me nowadays, I'm afraid. Uh, and that exchange control extended not just to individuals and households, but to firms and institutions. So when I began running the investment portfolio of my Oxford College, St. John's, in the 1970s, the only way we could invest in foreign securities was to pay something called the dollar premium to obtain part of a limited pool of, uh, of securities. And finally, most difficult to understand, but in the long run, most important. In the 1960s, there grew up something called the Euro-Dollar market. And the Euro-Dollar market consisted of American and European banks borrowing and lending to each other in London, outside the purview of the Federal Reserve System. And that was essentially the end of national control of domestic money and banking and the origins of the international financial system that we now have today. So today we live in a, a very different world. It's a world in which you can buy a cup of coffee anywhere from Aarhus to Zagreb or Los Angeles and pay with a plastic card in whatever the local currency is uh, and that will be debited in whatever currency you choose to hold your account in. We live in a world in which um, uh, firms maintain their accounts in many, in many currencies and preserve their accounts, present their public accounts in different currencies. For example, although Vodafone, BP, AstraZeneca are among the largest of British companies, AstraZeneca and BP present their accounts in dollars. Uh, Vodafone presents its accounts in, um, in euros. Most international trade is actually invoiced in, in dollars. 20% uh, of right, Europe into invoicing of exports is basically done in Europe, in euros. In the rest of the world, more than 80% of exports are actually invoiced in Europe, in dollars rather. Um, more than half of all the dollar notes in circulation are outside the United States. And of cross-border transactions in the world, 60% take place in dollars and 20% in Europe. The point I'm trying to make, and it's perhaps the central point which you need to take away from this evening, is that decisions about currencies, about what medium of exchange, unit of account uh, people will use, are no longer simply the purview of governments. They're made by the decisions of households, businesses, and, finance, and financial institutions. That's the world we live in, and we should stop thinking in terms of that 19th century world in which there was a national currency with a sovereign whose head was on the back of the gold coin. It's very misleading if we think about it in these kind of terms. So, so much has changed since these lectures which Innes Smith delivered in 1968. But there's some basic things which have not changed. In 1968 and before 1968 and after 1968, these were basics of understanding money. Money is something called is transferable debt. That's something which was actually laid out in a great book in the mid-19th century by Scottish economist Douglas MacLeod. He said that the, the idea that money, that, that debt could be transferred from one holder to the other was one of the greatest inventions of the human race. That's perhaps overstating it a bit, but it was a very important invention. And if you think about it, every time you make a financial transaction, what you're doing is you're making that in terms of transferable debt. When you pay for something in cash, you take out of your purse or your wallet a note which says uh, the Bank of England will pay you so much, and you pass that over to someone else, and they are then in the position that the Bank of England will pay them so much. 
That's not mostly how you nowadays make these transactions, however. By far the commonest way of making transactions is you make a bank transfer. When you pay your electricity bill, what happens is you um, uh, transfer a debt from the Bank of Scotland to you, and that becomes a debt of uh, the Royal Bank of Scotland to Scottish power. It's a matter of transferable debt. And you'll notice that the government is not a party to any of these. And the final way in which you make payments today is by using plastic cards. And it's quite complicated when you do what you do when you make a card payment. But what you're doing is you are incurring a debt to your credit card issuer, which is then transformed through the mechanisms of Visa and the like into a debt from the, the merchant whom you're buying the goods from, a debt from the merchant uh, to the merchant from the merchant's bank. So in each of these transactions, uh, there is debt being transferred from one person to another, and that's the mechanism by which money operates in a modern economy. And you'll see that the least important of these is actually the payment of cash. The other thing that Minister Smith told us was that money has three principal functions. The role of medium of exchange, which I've just been explaining, the, the, the unit of account, the way in which you keep track of your spending and your income, and the store of value. It's a way of keeping money, uh, of keeping value to use on a different occasion. And whatever the basis of money is, and whatever monetary systems have been adopted, money continues to fulfill these functions. That slide is the introduction to Money and Banking 101, and uh, everyone should, uh, if not have it engraved on their mind, at least remember what it says. Then there's the question of what we actually mean by money in the UK. And if I ask you what, how much money you have, and this being Britain, I would never actually dream of doing so. But if I were to ask you well, how much money you have, you would answer probably in one of two ways, or you interpret the question in one of two ways. You would think I was asking how much you had in your purse or wallet, or you might think I was asking how rich you are. But actually, an economist asking how much money there is, this is not what an economist means by money. An economist means by money means, well, I'm afraid one of several things. And I'm going to talk about three of these things, which are uh, helpfully labeled M0, M1, and M4. These are not ways of getting to Leeds and to Bristol. These are actually measures published by the Bank of England of the money supply in the UK. M0 is notes and coins in circulation plus commercial bank reserves at the Bank of England. And you'll see that M0 amounts to currently to 96 billion pounds, which may seem to you rather a lot. Uh, but actually, uh, it's both rather a lot and not very much in fairly obvious senses. It's rather a lot in the sense of that if I look at the largest component of M0, which is notes and coins in circulation, and observe that 65 billion pounds, that amounts to 1,000 pounds for every man, woman, and child in the United Kingdom. That amounts to about 3,000 pounds per household in the United Kingdom. And uh, I don't know how many of you often have a thousand pounds on your person, or three thousand um, pounds in your household. I certainly don't. And I don't, despite, I suspect, being, well, I don't suspect, I know, being a good deal richer than the average person in the UK. Uh, we need to ask, where is all this money? And the evidence seems to be that a very large part of it is in the illegal or semi-legal economy. And further evidence for that is produced by the fact that if we look at dollars and euros, we discover, for example, that more than half the euros in circulation 
are in euros, uh, are in euro notes of 500 euro denomination or larger. I noticed the last time I went into a French supermarket a month or two ago, they had a notice saying 500 euro notes are not accepted. These are not things which anyone would use in, in the normal way of transactions. So money is on, the one, is, on the one hand, there is rather more money in circulation than there should be, which is why a lot of people have written rather welcoming the idea that cash is, is dying because the other part of it is that cash is dying. I think every one of you, you in this room knows how you are making less and less use of cash and how the pandemic has actually greatly accelerated the way in which you no longer use cash. Cash is now used in less than 20% of retail transactions in the UK and during the pandemic, the amount of cash withdrawn from cash machines has fallen by 30%. I confess on getting that figure, I was surprised just how small it was. So, now naught is notes and coins plus commercial bank reserves at the Bank of England. That's the monetary base, which Innes Smith taught us to give a lot of attention to. The reason for that was that it was, that it was on that monetary base that M1 and M4 were built. What M1 is, is UK household and business sterling deposits with UK bank, banks. And you'll see in contrast to um, M0 of 96 billion, M1 is about um, nearly 25 times that. It's 2,290 billion. And finally, there's M4, which is not just household and business sterling deposits with UK, bank, with UK banks. It's the broadest measure of the money supply, and that includes, for example, commercial paper issued by large companies. You will learn from that is that physical money actually plays a minor role in a modern economy. This is just some numbers to give you some sort of perspective on all of this. Remarkably, we have three figures which are very close to each other. There's UK national income, there's UK government debt, and there's UK M1 basic money supply, which all, by coincidence at the moment, are currently rather similar numbers. We have a government deficit, which is pretty large by any normal standards, and M4 is a bit larger than M1, but not a great deal more. Physical money plays a minor role of all, in all of this, which is why when people talk about currency choices in Scotland and write essays on which uh, famous Scots would be portrayed on five pound or 50 bob e notes, they're engaged in a debate which has no practical significance and no practical relevance. If you ask what these numbers imply for an independent Scotland, then your starting point is to think that Scotland is about 8.5% of the UK. That's uh, something that you can apply to national income. Scottish national income uh, is about 160 billion, about 8% of the UK figure. Scottish government debt, well, we don't know what it would be, but it seems reasonable as a starting point to say that government debt would end up, one way or another, being prorated across the nations of the current UK, so that we'd be talking about a UK government, uh, a Scottish government debt, which might be of the order of 170, 180 billion, uh, uh, billion pounds. If it was uh, uh, at current times, uh, we would be adding a great deal to that government debt every year, but hopefully government debt levels, government deficit levels, will fall to uh, uh, lower levels than this. On the other hand, we have to accept the fact that it's likely that an independent Scottish government would begin with a rather larger government deficit than its pro rata share of the UK deficit today would imply. So these are basic numbers which we need to understand uh, in all of this. <clears throat> 
but to emphasize once again what I believe is the key point for you to take away from this evening, the decisions about what currency are going to be used in an independent Scotland are decisions which are going to be made not primarily by people deciding what money, what notes they have in their wallet. They're going to be decided by what debt they hold, what short-term assets they hold, what deposits they make, and the currencies in which they choose to make these deposits. That means that what currency is used in an independent Scotland is not exclusively or even primarily a matter for the Scottish Government. It's a matter for mobile Scots like myself. It's a matter for Marks and Spencers and Sainsbury's. It's a matter for Wood Group and Bailey Gifford. It's a matter for what cab drivers in Edinburgh choose to use, do and what the Balmoral Hotel chooses to you do. The decisions these people make in terms of the currencies they use, the units of account they deploy, and the stores of value they choose to use, these decisions are every bit as important as those made by the Scottish Government. That doesn't mean that the Scottish Government has no role. It does. Government has basically three functions in relation to currency. The first is that government determines something which is called legal tender. Each jurisdiction, each legal jurisdiction, has something called legal tender within ju that jurisdiction. If um, you want to uh, understand the unimportance of that in the modern world, Scotland is the paradigm case. Because in Scotland, by historical accident, the only thing which is currently legal tender is coins issued by the, the Royal Mint. That means the only strictly legal and definitive way of paying off your mortgage is to turn up to your bank with a pile of coins. You should reckon about a thousand kilos per hundred thousand of, um, uh, uh, of debt to repay. Of course, your bank will not be grateful for this, and nor will your cab driver, for that matter. I've never offered a cab driver a 10 pound note and had him turn round and say, look, that's not legal tender, Gov. Uh, what matters is the medium of exchange which people are prepared to accept, and that is not very, very different from what, from what legal tender is. Government can determine that, but it's of no practical importance. The second role of government is, of course, that government can pass legislation, and it can pass legislation to convert private contracts. Now, in some of what is written about this currency debate, that is something which it is envisaged that government would do. So a Scottish government could pass a law that says in any existing contract that says one pound, read ten bees or something instead. Now, it's possible to pass such legislation. And the paradigm recent example of such legislation was the European regulations which implemented the euro, which said for every contract that refers to the French franc, for example, where it says 6.56 French francs, now read one euro. That's legislation that government could pass. But recall, think of the conditions that made it possible to introduce that, uh, that provision. Firstly, you are not in reality changing the values of any one's current co contracts because European exchange rates had remained fixed relative to each other for 10 years prior to the introduction of the euro so that no one saw themselves as either gaining or losing as a result of this change. Secondly, all contracts in French francs were made under European law. And that means that they were all made under the jurisdiction uh, to which this applied. It is manifestly not the case, and it is very far from being the case, that all contracts in sterling are made under Scottish law. In fact, it's not necessarily the case that contracts between Scots 
or involving Scots, which are expressed in poems, are made under Scottish law. There are basically two ways in which a Scottish government could introduce legislation of this kind. One is it could say that the Scottish Parliament met in secret last night and it has passed a law that changes all your pound contracts to poor bees. The result of that there would be that you would spend the next few days looking at the small print of every agreement which you had ever signed and you would incur a lot of surprises when you did that. You would discover that the, the relevant jurisdiction was in many cases, it was in a large proportion of cases a jurisdiction outside Scotland and you would also discover that in many cases it wasn't that clear what the jurisdiction was. The result of that would be that the courts sort of, um, uh, of Scotland and indeed elsewhere would be clogged for many years with the resulting cases which people would implement. And more than that, since people would feel they'd gained and lost or lost as a result of these transactions, this would be open to challenge under European human rights provisions to which Scotland would presumably be a signatory. This isn't far from frivolous. Uh, train drivers who drove trains from parts of uh, the Czech Republic to parts of what is now Slovakia have been in the European court for many years. Some of them live in the Czech part of the country. Some of them lived in the Slovak part of the country. And what are their pensions payable in? This is an issue which we potentially have in spades if we do this. On the other hand, we could say that the Scottish, the Scottish Parliament will be debating this legislation next week, or more realistically, in three months or a year's time. And in that case, a great many people would be taking their contracts, their bank accounts, their, their credit cards, their loans, other things outside the jurisdiction of Scots law, and indeed a great many financial institutions would be unwilling to make contracts which might be subject to the jurisdiction of Scots law. This was in fact a mess as I've described in Czechoslovakia when things broke up. It would be a mess on a scale order, orders of magnitude greater if Scotland were to do this. I think if there is a second important lesson which I'd ask you to take away tonight, it is the lesson that the people who are advocating Scottish independence should make clear that it would not be in the intention of an independent Scottish government to introduce legislation of this kind. That a change to a new currency would apply only to agreements, private or public, which were made after the date of the change. There would be no intention of introducing legislation uh, uh, of that kind. It is hard to exaggerate the damage which could be done by a failure to recognize the importance of this issue. That means it would be up, as I've described, to firms, governments, and others to decide, firms, households, and others, to decide after the transition, after the introduction of a new Scottish currency, whether they wish to make these contracts in a, in a new Borby or whether they wish to carry on with their old sterling arrangements. Now, I imagine some people would choose to convert their, Borby, their, their bank accounts to Borbys out of patriotic fervor. I imagine others might feel the opposite way and want to maintain sterling, but people who are not interested in political statements I uh, might well prefer the familiar to the new. What would be the reason for making contracts in Borbees? It's not very obvious that the introduction of a new currency is very attractive to people in Scotland or to firms in Scotland. Which brings us to the third area in which governments can affect choices in this area, which is it's open to the government to choose its own unit of account. Indeed, that would be the natural mechanism by which a new currency was introduced. That a Scottish government decides from now on 
it will pay its employees in Borbees, and it will collect taxes in Borbees. Um, one might note immediately that the Scottish Government does not employ directly that many people, but the bulk of Scottish public expenditure goes through either local councils or NHS trusts, and it might be assumed that the government could expect, or indeed require, that these agencies would follow the government's own provisions and, for, and own, own recommendations. But that doesn't necessarily have impl any implications for what private sector agents would do. To take a, a ludicrous counterexample, if the Scottish government decided to adopt the Russian ruble or the, Europe, or the Vietnamese dong as its unit of account, or for that matter, if it decided to adopt Bitcoin as its unit of account, then probably what would happen would be people would simply convert as they received uh, their wages and salaries in dongs to, uh, to some more familiar currency like sterling. And similarly, people would do the same on the other side of the ledger uh, when they had to pay their taxes. There are quite complicated issues here. Uh, but the question then becomes, what is the quantity of the new Scottish B that is being issued relative to the quantity of the Scottish B which is being demanded? Now, initially, there would probably be rather more Scottish Bs being, there would probably be a shortage of Scottish Bs. People would be looking for it to pay their taxes, scrambling around to get money to pay taxes in. You can easily imagine a situation with a good deal of speculation about what the ultimate value of the B was going to be. There are two alternatives for the government. It either agrees that it will accept both salaries and, uh, uh, and taxes on a basis that there is a fixed exchange rate between the B and the familiar currency of sterling in which case nothing very much of substance has changed. Or the government decides to do something to leave this alone, in which case, of course, uh, Police Constable Burns, who receives his, uh, his check, or rather his bank transfer in Borbees, is pretty much at the mercy of global financial markets. And I have to say, having uh, my research assistant having given a small talk to a group once uh, about this issue in London. We've already received a couple of calls from hedge fund managers in the city who are interested in the opportunities for, for speculation which this, kind of, um, which this kind of introduction might provide. So I hope you've got the idea that currency transitions in a country like Scotland are not very easy. That is not to say they are impossible. And there are certainly examples around the world of currency transitions. But the two, the most relevant currency transitions, currency transi transitions in relatively uh, rich and advanced countries, the applicable ones seem to have happened quite a long time ago and took quite a, lot of transi quite a lengthy transitional period in order to introduce the most rapid is probably Singapore, for which it ran, the transition ran from 1965 to 1973. Perhaps the most relevant analogy for Scotland is Ireland, where the transitional period actually ran from 1922 to 1979. 1922, in which Brit Ireland was continuing to use sterling as if absolutely nothing had happened, to 1979, in which uh, the, Irish, uh, uh, the Irish pound was finally allowed to engage in a free float. You have an even longer transition actually in Australia, uh, which introduced the Australian pound in 1910, and it wasn't until 1983 that there was a free floating Australian dollar. As I say, these transitions uh, took a long time, and they are also quite a long time ago. There are no analogies for transitions of this kind in the modern world among relatively rich and advanced countries. 
And the closest analogy one can find is actually Greece, which decided not to make the transition out of the euro uh, in, the, in the early years of the last decade. The other recent transitions are all to do with the collapse of the Soviet Union, in which a whole range of countries uh, uh, in Eastern Europe uh, adopted their own currencies in place of the Russian ruble. We can take you through some of the history of what happened in these countries, uh, but I think there are two lessons which we will quickly take away. One is that we don't want to do in Scotland a lot of the things which were done in these countries. And the second part of the lesson is that these things were possible by virtue of the authoritarian regimes and the unsophisticated financial systems with which these, these countries emerged from, uh, emerged from, uh, from communism. So if it's difficult to do this, we need to ask the question, why do we actually want to do it? And the argument, which seems persuasive at the first sight, is we need in Scotland to be able to have an independent monetary policy. How could we be an independent country unless we're free to have our monetary policy, to fix our own interest rates, to determine our own money supply, to set our own exchange rate. Well, here again, it's useful to look at experience in other countries. If we look in Europe, there are probably three countries it's natural to look at, the three Scandinavian countries of Norway, Denmark, and Sweden, each of which are outside the, Euro, the, the Eurozone. Denmark, however, has successfully pegged its currency to the Euro since the formation of the Euro, and Norway is essentially sui generis because of Norway's heavy reliance on oil revenues and the dependence not just of the monetary system, but the whole Norwegian economy on that particular source. The most relevant case is probably Sweden. And uh, this is the history of the Swedish exchange rate. And you will see how much it has deviated from the euro over the last 20 years, to which the answer is, honestly, not very much. The, 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 the fluctuations of the euro against the, of the Swedish kroner against the euro are much smaller than its fluctuations against the dollar. The international value of the Swedish kroner is essentially dri driven by the exchange rate of the euro against the dollar rather than uh, the exchange rate uh, any autonomous exchange rate. And actually, as will emerge rather clearly here, Sweden has very limited capacity to pursue an independent monetary policy. You can see that they tried. Uh, they tried particularly in um, uh, ahead of the financial crisis where they were rather sensibly slower at lowering interest rates than other countries. The other attempt was when after the financial crisis, they tried to raise interest rates uh, uh, faster than was happening in Europe and the rest of the world. They tried that for a bit, uh, but the result was that the Swedish krona rose, that were the, there were strong objections from uh, Swedish exporters. And in the end, Sweden decided broadly to revert to the European norm. The amount of monetary freedom that Sweden has exists, but it's not that great. And if I look at the other clear analogy, which would be Canada and the United States, I find basically the same thing. That the Canadian dollar has almost always sat at a 20% discount to the American dollar. That premium, that, that difference discount was briefly eliminated in 2010, when people rightly saw Canadian banks as a rather sounder bet than American banks. But once faith in American banks returned as the financial crisis abated, uh, the Canadian dollar returned to its normal discount. We could do quantitative easing in Scotland as well, I suppose. That means buying up long-term government debt 
and replacing it by short-term government debt, which the British government has done on a huge scale over the last decade. We have difficulty doing that here because there wouldn't be any long-term Scottish government debt to begin with to buy. I guess a Scottish government could just start going around buying other things. There's no reason why you can't engage in quantitative easing by buying shops and offices and property of other kinds, and you could borrow short term in order to pay for that. You might find that people were not very enthusiastic about lending money to the Scottish Government on a short term basis in order to do it. And finally, for those who are really passionate about uh, having an independent Scottish currency, it's worth thinking for a moment about the Jersey option. Jersey, as those of you who have visited Jersey will know, has Jersey pounds. Jersey pounds are uh, trade at one-to-one with, uh, uh, with a pound sterling. And Jersey residents keep their accounts in pounds, and nobody asks whether they're Jersey pounds or English pounds because there is no practical difference. What they do have is rather pretty notes uh, and the States of Jersey Treasury encourages people to use uh, Jersey notes because they earn a small amount of seniorage income uh, from the basis of doing this. Uh, Jersey has sensibly maintained a reputation for conservatism in financial markets. It couldn't be the financial center it is if it didn't do that. Uh, and it limits the total amount of Jersey notes which can be printed by law to 125 billion pound, million pounds, which might equate to perhaps six billion in the case of Scotland, which would roughly equate to the total of the Scottish bank, the likely use of currency in, in, in Scotland. This would be an, an innocuous um, uh, uh, way of doing it. We asked the states of Jersey where they thought all these notes were uh, because even 125 million pounds is quite a lot relative to the size of the Jersey population. And it seems unlikely that money launderers are making much use of Jersey pounds. And their guess, which is probably mine, is that there are quite a lot of people who went to Jersey and ended up bringing back one or two Jersey notes, uh, which they either couldn't be bothered to change or which got pushed up in the washing machine when they wash their shorts after their jersey holiday. This is actually not entirely frivolous because introducing a Scottish currency in a way that would give a Scottish government options for the future could be done by imitating this rather pallid introduction of a currency which certainly does not involve the kind of problems which I've been describing. But let me sum up what I think is important for everyone in this audience to take away. The first important point is that this is not simply a matter of what the Scottish Government will do. The modern world is not like that anymore. And the Scottish Government can influence the choices which its private sector make, makes, but it cannot determine it. The second is that we need to accept the, with some realism the degree of economic independence which a Scottish government could actually enjoy in the modern world is limited. And it's especially true in monetary policy, where because of the growth of international financial markets, of which Scotland is inevitably part, and indeed Scotland profitably trades in international financial markets. Sadly, there were one or two institutions in the first uh, decades of uh, this century we didn't manage to trade profitably, but at any rate, our asset managers continue to do so. So the degree of independence which we can have in that, in that international financial world is limited. And that's just the way things are for a small country. Indeed, today I rather wonder how much real power and real influence the Bank of England has, that, that our reverence for the Bank of England derives from an era uh, when it was much more authoritative in the world than it is today, and important decisions about global money are taken 
in Frankfurt by the European Central Bank, in Washington by the Federal Reserve, and perhaps to an increasing degree in China, although that's still quite a long way off. We do not have a charterless world anymore in which money is associated with nationality and sovereignty, and we need to put these ideas out of our mind. I think if there's a lesson for us, it is first do no harm, which, as you will know, comes from the Hippocratic Oath. I've uh, had Hippocrates <coughs> flanked by Adam Smith, the great of all Scottish economists on the one hand, and Nicola Sturgeon on the other. First do no harm is, I think, a central tenant which ought to be part of uh, the heart of this debate. Uh, an ill-considered discussion, an ill-considered transition can do a great deal of damage both to the credibility of a Scottish government and to the credibility of a Scottish financial system. Inept discussion of transition can also do a great deal of damage to the potential credibility of a government and to the Scottish financial system. That means we should not go into this debate hastily or any transition hastily without having carefully planned and prepared uh, a runway uh, and a strategy for doing that. If you're prepared to envisage an extended transition, there are no limits to the ambitions which you can have. Thank you all. Thank you very much for that remarkable tour de force. And what I should have said at the beginning is that we are audio recording um, tonight's event. So at the risk of sounding like I do when I tell my kids to do their homework and revision, if you did want to do that money and banking 101 all over again, it will be available on the RSE uh, website. Thank you uh, very much. And we will open for discussion and questions. But first of all, for some provocative uh, thoughts, hopefully, um, and some responses over to Professor Greenroy. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Nicola. And it's a great pleasure to be here tonight and to give the response to John's remark. And it's a real honour to, to follow Sir John, a, a hero of mine and many economists of my generation. I actually first met uh, John when he was in the Council of Economic Advisers for the Scottish Government, and I was a relatively junior civil servant at the time with the view that senior civil servants should never be questioned, ever. And I remember one of the meetings we had a presentation from a Polish civil servant who had all the policy strategy buzzwords, who had all the, the infographics, all the PowerPoint presentations, all the buzzwords. And at the end of the presentation, the chair invited comments. And Sir John said in that quiet but powerful voice of himself, it's a very nice presentation, thank you. But you didn't actually tell us what the point of it is that you're trying to do. Cue an immediate quick redraft of the programme for government. Um, so the point about what I want to do tonight is wrangle through Professor Kay's proposition line by line. And hopefully we'll get a chance to do some of that in the Q&A. I wanted to offer you some reflections on the context in which his remarks sit. Now, clearly, we have our long journey to go before a referendum is called, to let a known held. And I hope John doesn't mind uh, me speaking on behalf of both of us when we say that any kind of political um, crystal ball gazing, we're delighted that Professor McEwen will handle all of those tricky questions. Um, but one of the things that really interests me is the extent to which the context has changed over the last seven years. And that sets the backdrop for the issues that Sir John has touched on. Now, of course, not everything has changed. So yes, supporters will argue that Scotland has the economic strengths to be an independent nation. Indeed, Andrew Wilson, who's here tonight, has argued that Scotland would be the richest newly independent country in history. And they'll point to examples to others from New Zealand to Scandinavia as evidence of, of the power to do things differently. Likewise, any Better Together refreshed campaign will return to familiar arguments that Holyrood already has a lot of powers to influence day-to-day -day life in Scotland. I will no doubt point to recent issues from ferries through to education and health outcomes as a counter to any argument that decisions taken in Scotland are always for the better. And arguments will also, I'm sure, be put forward that for all our strengths, the Scottish economy has challenges that could be exposed, at least initially under independence, not least our higher public expendi expenditure. 
And just as the financial crisis provided a really important backdrop in 2014, unionists, I'm sure, argue that COVID provides an illustration of the benefits of financial um, pooling and sharing. So debates in many ways will tread familiar grounds, but where are the differences and what might that uh, mean for the, the currency debate? So, well, firstly, on the economy, the decline in oil revenues, COVID-19 and weak growth even before the pandemic poses some challenging questions for those planning a smooth transition to independence. Um, GERS, you know, numbers that are out this year show a fiscal deficit of above 20% of GDP. Now, that will come down quickly. Um, but no longer can we hope that the relative gap in spending in Scotland can be closed by oil revenues. But clearly, Brexit has done the unionist case no favours either. And it's not just in trade. That's the area that we hear most of the debate on the economy. But Scotland's demographic outlook is much more challenging than for the UK as a whole. So the loss of freedom of movement, for me, is arguably a much more serious blow to Scotland's long-term growth potential than the, the barriers that have been erected on trade. Which brings me to my second difference, and that's the political, uh, the, the policy and constitutional perspective. Our Brexit is clearly the most significant constitutional upheaval in living memory. And for unionists, it isn't just an economic challenge, but one of economic credibility too. So putting up trade barriers with Scottish export markets that are larger than Australasia, North America, Africa, South America and Asia combined isn't, for me, a great example of better together. Now, more broadly, in 2014, the choice was between a quite different future under independence, obviously, and of what was seen at the time as being a relatively stable status quo. But with Brexit, um, that status quo is now different and also more uncertain. Also, since 2014, we've had the new powers of the Scottish Parliament, now perhaps not going far enough for some, but they have been extended in quite significant ways. And I guess in many ways that um, any argument that further devolution was going to cement Scotland's place in the Union you know, haven't, hasn't really borne, uh, borne fruit. And independence hasn't gone away. But the, tra the, the transition, even in the transition of the Smith powers, has shown that actually economic change is actually quite difficult um, to do. Um, on the one hand, though, we have actually seen with the new transfer of powers that if Scotland is given the powers to do things, they will do it differently, whether that be the new five-band income tax system, whether that be the child payment that was increased, um, increased uh, l last week. But Brexit and the Smith powers has shown that change isn't easy or always has an upside. So Holyrood is having to deal with what happens when your tax revenues don't grow as um, quickly as you would like. Uh, we've also seen that firsthand transitioning from one status quo to another can bring up some challenges. So in 2014, we were told that independence could take place in 18 months at a cost of a couple of hundred million pounds. But even if you just look at the transfer of the Smith powers, we're talking about 600 million pounds to transfer about 11 social security benefits and potentially up to a decade from when they were first recommended to actually being fully operational. So we're, we know much more that change is actually quite difficult to do. And we've seen it with Brexit. So for all that Brexit has um, created political opportunities for the people advocating independence and for all the protests of Scottish exporters over the mess of the UK's exit from the EU, we're political dynamite for the SNP in many ways. It, equally, it's not then convincing to wish away challenges with your market, which is three times as large as the EU. So, a lot of the challenge that we've seen in the last few years is so that change is difficult. And that's where I think that Sir John's comments about the importance of the transition and carefully managing the transition is absolutely crucial because um, what we've seen, even just on a smaller scale from Smith, but also through to Brexit, is that change is actually quite difficult to do. And it's crucial to get it right. It's OK to look at the long term, but the short term has really important implications, not just immediately for people, but also for that, the long term potential of your economy. And I guess the third element in all of this that's different from 2014 is the political dynamics. And if you look at the, uh, the work of uh, James Mitchell and Rob Johns, they've tracked the, the growth of the SNP. And what's really interesting on the economic front is that the, the, at the heart of that drive was the idea of competence and, and moderation. And that was be, that's been crucial to its success. And again, referencing Andrew Wilson, the, the famous prawn cocktail dinners that they had. I don't know if you had prawn cocktail, but um, these famous dinners where they toured the, board, the boardrooms of Scotland to make the case for the economic competence of the SNP. It was very much based on a pro-economic growth, a competence model that was underpinning that, that selling of that message. And the 2014 perspective was very much in that same vein as well. So full fiscal autonomy was the prize. 
coordinated financial regulation, fiscal stability, stability pact, limiting how much the Scottish Government could borrow, membership of the EU, and crucially, a shared currency. So that idea of competence and moderation was at the heart of that campaign. But now there's many in the Yes campaign who are seeking a more radical form of independence, irrespective of the, of the challenges on a, a transition. Indeed, some of them are now actually in government. Um, and that means that the lightning rod for all of this will come on to the issue of the, cur the currency and the issues that Sir John has so eloquently set out. And the currency is a uh, question, as Sir John mentioned, and the lack of a plan B was often described as the Achilles heel of the Yes campaign. And what Sir John's model does, tr try to do, is building on the work of the Sustainable Growth Commission, seek to strive that balance between competence and moderation, um, but also one that learns the lessons from 2014 and where the economics, I would argue the economics policy and constitutional context looks quite different. It doesn't rely on negotiating a currency union, and it leaves a door open for a, a, future, a, a new currency in the future. As John gave us the, 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 the money and banking 101, I should also say that University of Glasgow offer a really uh, fantastic course on that. Discounts are available for RSE <laughs> members. Um, but it reflects the way that money operates in the modern society. And, and crucially, in principle, it would limit the risks um, around assets and, and liabilities and facilitate that trade with the UK as it being our, our largest market. And crucially as well, it focuses on investor confidence. But like any other any currency option, there are challenges um, that would be useful to perhaps pick up into the Q&A. So as, as John mentioned, you wouldn't be setting interest rates in Scotland. Uh, interest rates would be set in the rest of the UK for the rest of the UK. But that might be OK if, in the long run, you're, the, the importance of having alignment with the UK is key. But if independence is about doing something different, about perhaps aligning more with the, with the European Union, then people might question and markets might question that strategy, at least over the long run. You wouldn't typically have a lender of last resort. The Scottish banking system will require some funds. Now, you could do that through building up reserves to fa facilitate that day-to-day -day clearing that you would have, uh, that you would need a lender of last resort. If instead you didn't have a banking sector but relied upon banks um, domiciled, uh, well, domiciled in Scotland but headquartered in London and regulated by um, uh, regulators down there, so essentially operating within to Scotland, that would avoid any issues about having to acquire a lender of last resort because you would have it um, uh, in, in UK taxpayers and out of London. But it might raise questions in the Bank of England about having a large-scale banking sector opposite, operating in what would be for them a foreign country. Might they require banks doing that to hold higher capital ratios? Might they require greater regulatory instruments if they were operating into a market which they weren't actually, oper they weren't actually controlling or regulating anymore because it was now classified, in their view, as being a foreign market? I think perhaps the biggest questions, and it would be really useful to get John's views on this, is around the macro questions around different currency models. Not about how money is operating, but actually how much money you're generating in your economy. So my colleague at Glasgow, Ronnie McDonald's, put some interesting questions out there about your ability to support your economy in a crisis if you can't do quantitative easing. So have you got that ability to print money when you urgently need it? Um, questions about running a really hard fiscal regime if you've got a balance of payments deficit or you've got a larger fiscal deficit in the UK. So how are you generating these pounds, these, these sterlings, as a real economy that can then operate, um, operate on, uh, throughout the Scottish, um, the Scottish economy? And again, one of the more political questions that would be interesting perhaps to turn to Nicola on all of this would be is, um, what might be the interesting monetary and fiscal requirements that the EU might require of us? Will sterilisation meet these requirements? Um, will the, a potential more slightly smaller central bank in terms of remit satisfy um, the European uh, uh, regulators and the European Commission for, for joining? And again, a further question for Nicola might be is how well might not having our own currency go down in the new yes movement. Um, and Alex Salmond, he's, he's talked about saying that the construction of a currency in rapid time should be a major priority for independent Scotland and the Green Party's opposition to, ster to retaining sterling. And the political dynamics in there have, uh, are much more complex than they were in 2014. But just as Sir John said, you know, I think it's really important, though, a, a, a really important caution here is it is really it's naive to think that creating your own currency means that it's a passport to operating in a world with no constraints. 
All of the choices in currency are about operating under constraints. It's just what constraints do you want to, do you want to operate um, under and which ones do you want to trade off? Um, and crucially, if you make the scale of the transition that much more difficult, and perhaps the, the, the transition becomes harder to do, then even if on paper you have greater ability to do things differently, the practical realities of that are not going to be, not going to be true because, you've, because of the constraints that you've placed on because you've made that transition harder. Which I guess brings me to my kind of conclu concluding point in all of this and back to the point that Sir John made to that civil servant um, all those years ago, which is what's the point? And it's understandable that people like us, Sir John and I, will talk about the technical issues such as currency and John should be commended for exploring these options. But it strikes me that both proponents of both yes and no, um, not John or I, but yet proponents of yes and no, have work to do to set out their future vision for Scotland post-Brexit, post-Covid, and into a net zero world. And on the yes side, many of the ideas in the white paper, even just eight, that, that was eight years ago since the white paper, policies on cutting corporation tax, cutting air passenger duty have been dropped. Policies on childcare have actually been delivered now. Um, the Growth Commission did offer interesting suggestions, but sadly that's one part of the report that actually is, doesn't get the attention it deserves. So how do we move on to the... About if, if you're going to go through these transitions, what is it you actually want to use these powers for? What are you going to do differently? But crucially, we need to ask the same questions to the unionist side as well. So what is the new vision for, um, for, for the union? And Stephen Gethins, the former MP and colleague in the Scottish Government with me, has, has posed a really interesting question, saying that while it's right that we question politicians over independence and its consequences, post-Brexit there is no status quo and people deserve answers on the consequences of remaining the union. And it's an interesting turn of phrase, but he's right. And it's not enough simply to point out sh about the risks of short-term transition to independence if the long-term vision for the union is missing. Might that involve more powers or might it be the levelling up agenda or so-called muscular unionism? And how might all this, of, uh, how might this work? And fundamentally, what does each option, whether independence or Scotland remaining in, in the UK, um, mean for our ability to tackle the inequalities in society, to level up our country and to, to focus on the issues that really matter to the people of Scotland? So I congratulate John on his really thoughtful contribution. In 2014, just after the referendum, he said the no verdict in September was not the end of the argument. But at the beginning, I remember thinking that um, I, didn't, I didn't agree with him at the time. I think the seven years have proven that John was entirely correct. And um, I really hope to continue the discussion in the Q&A. Thank you very much. Thank you, Graham. Thank you very much. Um, so over to you. Um, if you would like to make a comment or ask a question, if you could please raise your hand and then one of the staff will come with a microphone, which will then be cleansed before it goes to the next person, so we're COVID safe here, so. Yes, sir. Uh, good evening, thank you. Um, my name's uh, Dr. Kevin Parker. Um, I spent the early years of the 1990s in the ex-Yugoslav republics of Slovenia and Croatia. I was struck by what uh, Professor Kay said um, about the experiences of the post-Soviet republics um, but there you had two countries of middling GDP per head, roughly the same as Greece, who, um, uh, who together have a slightly smaller population than Scotland, and who both managed to set up the independent currencies and operate them for 10 years in a pretty short space of time. I, I just wonder if Professor Kay had studied those countries and do you consider that those countries were successful in that efforts, or did they make some of the mistakes that you alluded to uh, on the post-Soviet bloc? Thank you. Thank you. I'll gather a few questions, if I may, okay. um, just to give everyone an opportunity. Um, anyone else? Yes. Uh, thank you. I was wondering if Scotland did uh, go independent and rejoined the, um, the Europe, the EU, sorry, um, do you think there would be a pressure to uh, in, take on the euro? And if so, what consequences would that have, do you think? And we'll take one more. Yes, sir. Hi, uh, Graham doesn't seem to have proposed another option to the currency. 
uh, which should be used in independent Scotland to stop seem to be about whether we should be independent or not. So uh, what's the point you are making, Graham? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, John, would you like to go first, please? Um, okay, I, uh, the, the, right, the, the two addressed to me. One was, have we looked at the experience of the ex-Soviet Union? Yes, we have. We haven't devoted much time specifically to um, uh, Slovenia and uh, these Balkan countries. Uh, but we've, we've looked at the Baltics and at some of the Soviet republics. The basic answer to the question is, in the end, all these countries manage to come up with something. In many of them, there was chaos uh, or, or a degree of chaos in the course of the transition. In none of them uh, was there any close analogy to the Scottish case for two reasons, both to do with the transition from communism one was the possibility of a kind of authoritarianism, which I think would be impossible in Scotland. For example, in Estonia, which was uh, relatively aggressively declaring its adherence to, to Europe, it was actually made illegal to use the euro. I hope we could, or to use the ruble. I hope we could not think of having these kind of provisions in, in, in Scotland. The other is that by virtue of the transition from communism, all these countries began with relatively unsophisticated financial systems by Western European standards. Scotland, by contrast, begins with an extremely sophisticated financial system by almost any standards. So there is not, I think, much to be learnt. We had a look at Kazakhstan, mainly to think that um, you're not going to learn from much from Kazakhstan, except in a negative sense. Um, on the other question, <clears throat> which is about the EU, th this is a complicated issue which would deserve a whole paper on its own. Um, I find it hard to see, as things are at the moment, Scotland be a, a, making a straightforward application for membership of the EU. There are two issues there. One is that um, Scotland uh, has in spades the Northern Irish border pr question. And I think there is little point about talking about Scottish membership of the EU until we see how that evolves and what solutions are found, if indeed any can be found to the problems with the, which the Northern Irish border raises. The second issue, which is that what other commitments which a, a Scottish government would have to take on if it joined the EU? Well, it would have to accept that the uh, the euro is the currency of the EU and that there is an aspiration to join the EU one day. One day might be a very long way away and I imagine that would be quite widely accepted. The other is that there are specific provisions in the EU about adherence to uh, Maastricht criteria and the like which Sweden has succeeded in interpreting in a rather evasive way. At the moment, we have the rather bizarre position of Montenegro, which cannot comply, which although it's on the point of joining the EU, cannot actually comply with this condition of the acquis. The reason being that the acquis visualizes you aligning your currency with the euro. But since currently Montenegro does not have a currency, but uses the euro, it is not possible for it to, to line its currency with the euro. It is not beyond with the, the wit of man to think of a solution to this problem. But the, uh, the finding of that self-evident solution depends on political will. And the history of the EU, I think, is in general, if there is political will, technical problems will be solved. If there is no political will, they will turn out to be insoluble. So I think that takes one to what Nicola will know more about than I do by some measure, which is, I think, the largest, the, the other large problem Scotland has in relation to the EU is secession prospects in other states, such as Spain, Belgium, and conceivably Italy. And the, the question becomes, in Sc prospective Scottish membership, how much political drive there would be from the major members like France and Germany to bring Scotland 
into the EU, but that's a political matter. I don't feel competent to discuss any further. Uh, but I don't think this uh, issue of Scottish relationship to the Euro is actually the main issue about Scottish affiliation or membership of the EU. I will refrain from commenting further and hand over to, to Graham. Yeah, so, so your question was exactly my point in that um, what John does and what the broader option about different currency options as well is that anyone who argues there isn't a solution to Scotland's currency question is wrong. It's not sufficient just to say that Scotland can't be independent because it doesn't have an option for currency. It does have options, um, but it would require a huge transition. So the question for me is to put to the unionist side is it's not sufficient just simply to, to, to point to technical difficulties if you don't have a story to tell about what the future of the union is. Equally, though, what John's highlighted and spoken about this evening is that you can find solution to currency, but there's lots of big issues in there. There's constraints, there's pressures, there's trade-offs, there's long-term transitions. So if you're going to go through that, what's the argument of people proposing independence? What do you gain by putting all of, going through all of those transition and all of those challenges there? And that, for me, is a fundamental question. So it's okay to talk about technical issues, but the duty is also on people advocating independence or advocating union, what's the point of this? And what is the objective that are trying to achieve? Thank you. We have time for at least one other round of questions, maybe a little bit, yes. Thanks very much, and thanks for that. You talked about the three reasons why some would advocate moving to an independent currency as quickly as possible. And one of those reasons was quantitative easing. And I guess my question is, would it be such a great loss not to be able to conduct quantitative easing? Any other questions just now? Um, yes, the gentleman here. And apologies, Cabinet Secretary, it's hard to recognise anyone in a mask. So. Uh, good evening. Uh, it's Dr. Tim Rydout, convener of the Scottish Currency Group and also the author of the SNP Conferences Policies on Currency. Uh, and most recently on Sunday, we decided to start the preparations for the Scottish Reserve Bank as the new Central Bank of Scotland. Uh, can I, anyone on the panel uh, identify any relatively advanced modern economy uh, that has ever sought to use the currency of another country? One more, if we have one more. Yep, this lady. Do you want to raise your hand a bit higher so Ms. Steph can? Oh, maybe it's, yes, yes. Sorry. I'm afraid this is economics 101 question, but in the Danish model or Ireland before 1979, how do you peg a currency to another currency? Does it need an ERM type solution or is there some other mechanism? Great, thank you. I think all of these were for you, John. Right. Okay, um, I, I talked about three aspects of having an independent monetary policy. Um, the QE is one. I confess to sharing your implicit doubt that uh, QE has been the, the marvelous success that the central banks of the world would, uh, uh, would proclaim it as being. Second question, how does Denmark do it? <clears throat> the answer basically is that the, the Danish currency is pegged to the euro at a level which is too low, which means that if Denmark, if the Danish currency were allowed to appreciate, uh, were allowed to float, it would certainly appreciate. The same is true of the other long-term successful peg, which is the Hong Kong dollar, which is pegged to the US dollar. Both these currencies would appreciate. The result of that is in both cases, there has been some currency flow into these, cur into these currencies. And the result is that the monetary boards, the monetary board in Hong Kong uh, and the, the Danish central bank has had no difficulty in maintaining the peg. Uh, and basically it sells Danish kroner or the monetary authority in Hong Kong sells Hong Kong dollars in order to keep the exchange rate down. Obviously, if the Scottish government was pay, a Scottish currency was paid compellingly um, at some low level, sufficiently low level, and it's not clear how low a level it would have to be, then one could imagine a similar 
situation in relation to a peg of the Scottish currency. In answer to the question, is there another case of an advanced country uh, becoming newly independent and using the currency of another country? The answer is no. I'm not quite sure what point that leads to, but the answer is no. Thank you. Do you want to add anything, Graham? Um, I think there's a, there's a question about quantitative easing as, a, as an overall policy objective. I think um, what we've probably seen, I think broadening it out into during the pandemic, the ability to have monetary and fiscal coordination, I think is, is something which I think is, is, I think we still need to see feel the full lessons of that. But I think that's where probably I would say that's distinct from having a broader discussion about quantitative easing, the ability to see what's happened over the last 18 months about the Bank of England essentially monetizing the debt, to a, the deficit to a significant extent. And you wouldn't have that under under sterilisation. Um, the broader point, just, just quickly on, on Tim's point there about uh, other countries doing that, I think the answer is no, um, which I guess gets to my question as well about how that would then be consistent with questions around EU membership, etc. And I know it's all part of a negotiation, but um, if there's no precedent for that, um, how would then the EU approach that view of, 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 a, of not having another currency? So, Graham, we might notice the point that the Bank of England is doing quantitative easing for us, whether we like it or not, and that would continue to be the case, whatever currency a Scottish government used. The spraying uh, short-term debt around in substitution for long-term debt is something that spills over the borders of the yeah. jurisdiction in which the transaction takes place. Mm -hmm. That's back to the point I made at yeah. the end, which is that we greatly exaggerate the amount of influence which the Bank of England mm -hmm. has relative to the European Central Bank, and which the European Central Bank mm -hmm. has relative to the Fed. Essentially, mm -hmm. we're all small players in this world now. Mm -hmm. And that's, in a sense, the answer to the, uh, the point which I think was being made in asking, has any advanced country done it? It's not much point, really. Uh, can I ask a banking and money 101 question too? If part of the political rationale for independence now is to reorientate Scotland towards the European Union in light of Brexit, would there be sense if one was to suggest pegging a currency to another more stable and established currency to peg it to the euro rather than to the pound. Ooh, um, there's a lecture coming in Economics <laughs> and Banking 101 on optimal currency areas, which are to do with your trading patterns uh, and the things that follow from that. And uh, uh, there's a chicken and egg issue here. Basically, Scotland's trading patterns at the moment are far more aligned towards our, towards our UK than they are towards Europe. Um, if they became more aligned towards our UK, it would be more sensible, it would be sensible to start looking towards the Euro. And indeed, to go back to the theme of what I was saying, Scottish firms and Scottish institutions would be doing that anyway as Scotland became more in, uh, involved with the EU. It's not just a matter of what the government does. And pegging currencies is difficult, especially in the, in the modern world of rather aggressive financial speculation. We shouldn't forget that back in 1992, uh, Soros and a small group of speculators were able, in inverted commas, to break the Bank of England. They made the, they made the maintaining of a peg uh, simply impossible by virtue of the vo volume of money they could throw at it. In the case of a, a Scottish government, that looks even more scary because the resources of the, the global financial system relative to the resources of a Scottish central bank are orders of magnitude different. On that note, um, thank you so much. We've come to the end of our event this evening. There will be many others, I'm sure, um, in the months and years to come. The, Constitutional debate in Scotland has frustratingly in some ways um, in recent times focused on issues of process, of whether 
there will be a referendum, whether there can be a referendum. And this was really an opportunity to, to explore with the incredible insight offered by uh, Sir John and, and also by Professor Roy, some issues of real substance. And I think it seems to me that this next year to 18 months offers many opportunities, should offer many opportunities for exploring some of these things um, in depth. Uh, so thank you very much uh, for coming uh, this evening. And if you could show your appreciation uh, to our panel in the usual way, please. Thank you.